I'm the academic advisor for the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, and today it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce two Pitt alumni. Uh, we're gonna talk about the work that they've been doing um, since, uh, since graduating from the University of Pittsburgh in, in, in 2016. Uh, this is part of our, our focus on careers in uh, security, intelligence, and diplomacy. Uh, and uh, our two speakers today come from a, a, a company called Noveta. Uh, first is Dr. Elise Thorson, uh, who is a senior open source analyst at Noveta. Uh, and this company provides advanced analytics and technical solutions to defense, to the intelligence community, and other US government customers. Uh, Elise has spent most of her professional life uh, oriented toward Russian studies, beginning her uh, beginning with a BA in Russian studies from the College of William and Mary, and graduating from the Russian literature PhD program uh, in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Pitt in 2016. Uh, having spent a cumulative three years uh, researching in the former Soviet Union. As an analyst, she leads uh, reporting on trends in the content, sentiment, and sources of misinformation in publicly available information circulating uh, in Europe, as well as managing the design and maintenance of data collection schemas. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Beach Gray, who is also a senior open source analyst at Noveta. Uh, Beach has spent time working and researching in Russia and Kazakhstan. He earned a BA in Russian studies from Williams College in 2007 and an interdisciplinary PhD in film studies through the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Pittsburgh in 2016. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, did you both do the RIS certificate as well while you were uh, grad students? Yes, and also uh, completed the RIS certificate, uh, the certificate in Russian, East European and Eurasian studies, which is my wheelhouse. Um, so also graduated in 2016. Beach has published academically in Cinema Soros, Russian Film and Contemporary Context, Directory of World Cinema, Russia 2, Kino Kultura, and Slavic and East European Journal. And professionally for Noveta's online blog and for the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, in his work as an analyst, he co-leads a team that reports data-driven trends in publicly available information in Europe with a special focus on mis- and disinformation. And so with that, I'll uh, hand it over to our guests. Thank you so much. Hi. I'm actually very, it might not seem clear from that introduction that Beach and I work extremely closely together every day because we had such, we had slightly different approaches to how we were describing our work um, but I really like Beach's description of our job. And so I want, which he composed for us. So I'd like to kind of pass it over to him first. Um, so I can share that slide if you'd like, Beach. Please. Do, do, do. And uh, just want to say hi to everybody. Thanks, Trevor, for having us. And what we'll do is kind of describe the work that we do uh, in broad strokes. And then Elise and I will give kind of our personal narratives of how we got our jobs, because that's actually the, the, the point of this and the really hard thing to do. And then we'll have time and we want to have a dialogue uh, with all of you all to, to hear about your interests, to, have, to answer any questions you have, uh, you know, about our jobs, of course, but specifically about getting a job, because even if you're very well educated, uh, as, as all of you are, sh I am sure are, it's still uh, a difficult task. Uh, yes, can you, thank you, Elise, can you go on to the next slide, please? And the next slide. <laughs> okay, so um, what we do is, is we are developing assessments for US uh, strategic communications um, and with an eye to opportunities and vulnerabilities. That means basically how is the US being perceived uh, in Europe and other places around the world? And we do that, if you look at the third bullet point, specifically through analyzing what's already out there, so nothing that's not out there, that's not freely available, 
in traditional media, which is online print media, like the New York Times online and social media, but only what's publicly available. And so we can zoom in with uh, our taxonomies. We can zoom in to specific topics uh, that our customer cares about. So for example, uh, when former President Trump uh, announced that U.S. troops would, would be withdrawing for German, from Germany. We can look at the reaction to that. You know, uh, when the U.S. has sanctions on Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline, the natural gas pipeline that uh, will go from Russia to Germany and will su supply Europe with natural gas, we can really look at that at a very high level uh, in detail and sort of say, okay, this is a trend. And this is how it compares, you know, uh, to a similar event or a different event. And we have big, big data is our friend when, when it comes to that. So uh, that's what we're doing. We're, we're making reports uh, on a daily basis. And so as an analyst, we're not just saying, hey, here's what happened in the news. We're saying this is the reception in the news, uh, in uh, traditional social media of what happened. So, you know, there's a vulnerability in this. Russian, you know, narrative is getting out there or, you know, there's an opportunity to say, hey, the U.S. is doing good things just to, to, to remind everybody. So uh, what does that have to do with you and how, how might that be applicable to you? So as an analyst, you know, you're thinking and you're analyzing, you're interpreting, and that's where all of your educational background goes in. So you read Anna Karenina, but that doesn't matter. Uh, no one's going to ask you in terms of like what was the plot or uh, you know when was it written or something like that. But the fact that you read it and that you have this deep knowledge of culture and politics means that you're going to be able to interpret Russian messaging in a way that uh, other people who do not have that background cannot. The fact that you spent time in Eastern Europe means that you understand it uh, in ways that other people do not. The fact that you can read a native language and not just rely on Google Translate means that you are a valuable asset. So the two skills of being an analyst, in addition to thinking, is writing, which is a skill, and not that many people, uh, surprisingly, uh, are, are, are um, you know, necessarily proficient at that. So that's a skill you already have. And the other skill you already have that, uh, that would be applicable to this job is this deep knowledge of culture and politics that you've accumulated through your education. So that's the analyst part. The open source is we're just looking at what's already out there. Uh, we're not uh, doing other sources of information that are classified um, that, you know, maybe like so, something that has to do with uh, intercepting signals or, 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 you know, any sort of thing having to do with human intelligence. So it's just what's out there, uh, you know, on the internet, printed, freely available, and not private in any way. And then uh, senior is that Elise and I, uh, through doing good work, but also uh, being at the right place at the right time, we're able to advance in the company to a junior management role where we oversee people and uh, you know help them make the team better. And um, it also means that you know we have a little bit more responsibility for for the final products we produce uh, for the customer. So that's the, the general uh, description of what we do. It would be highly relevant to all of you all for, from your experience uh, in education. And I'll turn it back over to Elise. Yeah, and I'll just note as we move into a short description of our methodologies and our big problems and where those intersect and make our expertise most relevant, that this is all agnostic in the sense of we aren't trying to, we don't know anything about what the US messaging strategy is. We don't, we certainly don't know anything about what the Russian messaging strategy is apart from what we can see. And so what we are very good at providing is our own picture, uh, rather a, a, an unbiased picture of what's going on. There's always, I hope that there are some social scientists in the 
in the audience who can start to pick holes in the ideas of how we how we collect data because I always appreciate those conversations. But at the same time, we aren't going out and, and only looking at um, the, we, we don't know what we're looking for. And so we show people what is actually, what, what is actually being said as opposed to what, as opposed to being falling prey in the sense to motivated reasoning. So while we are susceptible to all sorts of biases that come from gathering information, I would say that the one that we are not susceptible to is motivated reasoning where we go out and find, cherry pick the information that will um, give, our, give our client the answer that they would like to hear. Um, so just wanted to get into the nitty gritty of how, of what we spend all of our time on every day. So one of the elements that we spend all of our time on is basically managing how we're going to consume, how we're going to ingest information. And that comes down to three choices that our company and our methodology needs to make. And the first is which outlets are we going to follow? So Beach mentioned that we are, that we are mostly a legacy media shop. We look at newspapers online, online news, uh, newspapers that only exist online, uh, the online presence of television channels and radio stations, if they happen to be influential. We have to make decisions about what we're going to, what we're going to consume, what we're going to make sure is available to us in the database based on priorities that are given to us by the customer about um, problem areas. So one might imagine Ukraine is a hot zone. There's a, an ongoing civil war in Ukraine. We pay attention a lot to, what's, to what Ukrainian media say. Um, if I wanted to be less traditional media oriented, we, this is not the, the, the tool we have is not specifically made for traditional legacy media. It's made for any information that we have, any basically text-based information we've got. So this, could, this choice that we're making could also be what users are you going to follow on social media or what are the what are the queries that you will have consistently feeding feeding information um, from social media so there are a number of social, social media aggregators out there that collect from the fire hose of twitter and will return relatively high quality answers to the uh, information to you based on you saying, I would like to know everything that is said about, I don't know, the US government since, since we have introduced the US messaging um, a lot in this, in this presentation already. So those are, that's one place where choices have to be made. The next is article level. This is basically figuring out what topics we want to, want to follow. We might be following Russia uh, RT, it's not Russia today anymore. It totally rebranded to be just letters RT. We might be saying we want to follow RT, but RT produces a lot of stuff and it's not all relevant to our, our interests. Some of it is about maybe the Pacific instead of Europe, which is what we're focused on. That's our geographic focus. So we want to, or they could be talking about chip development and we're actually much more interested in petrol in Russia's energy trade priorities. So what we want to do is make sure that we're choosing the right kinds of articles that we're predicting the the key the key topics of interest and that we aren't missing something that will later become important because if there's one thing that I think personally, I've learned a lot over the past four, five years, nearly five years. It's that um, you should rely, you should be competent in what you know as an expert in area studies, that this will be important, that they will ask about this, even if they don't know that they're going to ask about this now. 
And then finally, the bread and butter of our work is quote-based analysis, which could also be tweet-based. It could be sentence-level analysis, where we characterize the, the key sources of information and, um, and the patterns that emerge in communication strategies based on who's quoted, um, what the sources of information are that are cited in larger, larger works. And this kind of brings me into the data, data enabled questions where it's this question of who's visible, who's, who's getting to drive the conversation, what are they deciding to talk about? And what do they, what message do they want to, to, to convey? Who do they think is, what, what sentiment do they want to, to laden the, the discourse with? For example, going back to Ukraine, is it going to be Ukraine is weak or, sorry, the Russian, Russian official messaging about Ukraine. When you feel negatively about Ukraine, is it because you want people to think that Ukraine is a failed state or because it's a fascist state? There are different ways of understanding what the general negative feelings are. And likewise, there are certainly more positive communications that one can um, sub transmit or attempt to transmit in media about Ukraine. Like it is committed to democracy and oriented to oriented towards multilateral solutions to big problems in, in the region. These are probably the kinds of questions that you are used to asking if you come out of a communications background or um, or any sort of discourse analysis background where you go and you tag um, you tag sets of data with information. We've got what we what we have going for us is that we don't have we don't have just bespoke projects that we are working on the way that you might in a um, in a research seminar, but we have really relatively big data where we're just adding this information to tons of articles and outlets and quotes so that we can see at a, that, so that we can pull out in a very multidimensional kind of way. What are the constants? What are the trends? What are the pivots in communication strategies? And um, a favorite question that we like to be asked is, is this thing that we just did a big deal or a small deal? Um, and we can say, well, there were there, you know, like two articles about it and they didn't really say very much. So probably small deal um, versus, versus larger um, or, or rather this really blew up and we have no idea why or rather, and we'll explain why because we've just noticed this through the power of big data. And so that is our, that's what we spend a lot of time doing is managing all of these questions that arise from deciding what our units are going to be, asking what data, uh, asking the questions that this data gives us and answering the questions that we get given. I want to highlight one kind of interesting element of our work, which is when this project, when the project that Beach and I work on first began, I think that there was a very strong, which was in 2016, you might remember that there was a lot of discourse about fake news and the unfathomable influence that Russia seemed to have over everything. So, um, and we didn't know what was working and what wasn't. We just knew that Russia was doing a lot. And so a, one of the more interesting questions that we have to keep in mind that is actually in the end very difficult and really brings to bear the importance of expertise and a, an ability to appreciate and convey nuance via such things as the writing skills that Beach mentioned is to, is to really navigate through the information environment and give our customers the ability to navigate through um, the environment. Because it's really like that big data thing that I was just describing, that's not really great for finding fake news because that's like, look, we found this random outlet that 
three people read and they said something fake and it was probably funded by Russia. And that is like, I'm going to be untechnical. That's like 95% of the fake news um, discussion out there. And what's more important is how does that fake news that is funded by Russia on an outlet that nobody reads, how does that make it to the human eyes? And it's through things like laundering, there's a, you can do some fast, you can, at this point, I think that that must be published and it's fa fascinating to hear from experts about the Russian media environment, about how an entire layer of, of Russian media has emerged in the last two or three years that just is another layer in the laundering of, of narrative upwards until it, be, it reaches larger audiences. And it all has to do with how people, how outlets cite each other and, and kind of boost, boost the ratings. And that's what we need to pay attention to is how that ecosystem works. Um, so the thing that, the next most interesting thing after fake news that people really want to know about is disinformation. And this is a case where OSINT, open source intelligence is not awesome because you really have to know where bad information is originating from. That you have to know, you have to be able to attribute inauthentic behavior, which you, you can see. You have to be able to attribute it to, an, to a malicious actor and be able to figure out what the intent was of that bad information. But all the same, sometimes it's, sometimes it's clear. Most of the time, what we see are patterns in, in disclosed disinformation at disclosed disinformation campaigns. So we've already found out what the, we've already discovered that it was disinformation. It's not us uncovering it, but it is uncovering the patterns in, in what disclosed disinformation campaigns are containing. So we can then make inferences about what else might be disinformation or what those what the goals and intents might be. The question of misinformation is already getting into maybe we can start using big data um, to really understand how poorly sourced or incorrect or incomplete information circulates and um, what drives it, what the sentiment is necessary, what the sort of what the sources might be, who the what the topics are that are very tradition that are very hot for misinformation might be, um, and we can by virtue of monitoring these monitoring this kind of information, we can disclose we can uncover vulnerabilities that then we can can. sorry, that then we can report to our customers. The thing that we see the most of though, is people taking advantage of, of all sorts of actors in the media and information environment, taking advantage of the structure of the media environment to get across, kind of just manipulate it. It's, it's where Russia, like just use a kind of, a, a kind of anodyne, benign example. It's like Russia will always, always mention that sanctions are no good for anybody. And you can't really argue with that, but you can argue that sanctions, um, that sanctions are bad for Europe and, and they hurt everybody. And wouldn't it be nice if we just forgot the reason that the sanctions were levied and that strategic messaging, because you're not mentioning the entire picture of why the sanctions were levied. Um, that you never mention Ukraine in the same work in the same breath. Um, you just kind of mention, oh, aren't you aren't you hurting? The EU EU citizens are hurting because of the of the sanctions, the counter sanctions that Russia levied against against the EU for, um, and never mentioning that it's counter sanctions as opposed to sanctions themselves. Um, so. Strategic messaging turns a, a complex picture into something simple. 
irony and jokes and political lies where you get across big, uh, and, and political lies where basically you say something that's not true and then maybe you say, well, I was just joking or maybe you don't get called on it. And I think that we see that the most of all in our information environment. And then finally, it's just kind of, you can see this, I read the US news the most of all, but the idea that uh, um, politics is all about a horse race, for example, that is really about who's winning and who's losing as opposed to what people what people's positions are. And that is a banalization of the information, of uh, discourse and the information inside of print. And I'm gonna pause here because I saw Beach unmute and had something to say. Yeah, thank you, Elise. I, I really like that uh, description of information pollution. And just to give you a concrete example of what Elise was talking about uh, at the end there, where it's just about, you know, sometimes it's not disinformation, sometimes, you know, which is false information with a bad intent or misinformation, just false information that gets out there, uh, it, you know, it's a strategy. So uh, a concrete example is, you know, uh, that Russia has developed this vaccine Sputnik V against COVID and they uh, registered it before it went through phase three trials. And the phase three trials are the big trials where several thousand people, you know, are inoculated and there's a placebo. And so that's like the gold standard, the Western standard. And Russia was already, you know, announcing that they were ready to go uh, with the vaccine before that happened. So they, you know, got a lot of media attention. And, um, and the thing that we saw in, in big data uh, with, through our big data and that we were able to see that we would not been, would not have been able to uh, conclude without big data is that actually the thing that was resonating uh, was that Putin had said, you know, uh, I'm gonna get the vaccine, my daughter has already got the vaccine. So he was being quoted for saying that, uh, whereas, and he was the most quoted when it came to, um, when it came to the vaccine. And this is a special project we did for Africa. But anyway, for African media, he's the most quoted because he you know, made this big claim and backed the vaccine through his personal, you know, um, his personal sort of cult of personality. And among Russian uh, speakers, he's the most quoted. Whereas when it came to the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, it was you know the CEOs of companies that were being quoted most, or you know it was uh, people from the CDC or um, some somebody along those lines. So it's not wrong, it's not false, but by saying, hey, we're going to register the vaccine first, I'm going to vouch for it, and sort of brushing aside the conversation of is it safe. Does it pass the necessary trials that we go through to make some sure something is safe? We can see, whoa, you know, they kind of uh, they kind of manipulated the media environment. They got their message out there, and now the rest of us are playing backup. And it does matter because you know uh, it's about the health of people. Now we know that when it was all said and done, it turned out that the vaccine was ninety two percent effective. So Russia got lucky there, and you know, people will be vaccinated and that's all good. But that's an example of how the media can be very much manipulated through personality. And it's something that, you know, we track. And our database that Elise mentioned is not trivial. We have, you know, dozens of outlets in several different countries and we have over 1 million quotations. So you can learn things from that data set that you wouldn't know if you're just a talking head. Back to you, Elise. Yeah, and the really fun thing, like, I think that perhaps the distribution of, of space on this slide is underselling how much time we spend on that manipulation of the in information environment. And it is seriously something I really have to refresh after I've read nothing but Russian coverage of Sputnik V. For, for a while, it's like, why do people not, why are people, is there any reason besides Russophobia that people aren't, aren't uh, really enthusiastic about Sputnik V in Europe? And it's like, oh, right, it needs to go through regulation. And 
gosh, Russia seems to promise a lot, an awful lot of vaccines to people when they're not actually delivering it. Wow. I, um, so the, the manipulation is a big thing. And the fun thing, I think the most fun thing that Beach and I get to do is really try to figure out how to go from, from this tool that we've got, which is powerful and also limited by the virtue of its structuredness to being able to describe all this mishmash. And, um, and it's really valuable to be able to tell people where they stand in the information environment. Um, and what opportunities there are to influence it or to improve your own position or to make it healthier. I, I, I feel like we don't get to do an awful lot of that because it's just, we happen to be supporting a customer that doesn't have like direct control over anything um, in, the, in Europe, which rightly so. But I, I kind of like being able to point out things like, wow, Romanian, Moldovan media seems to be very single source. Like you just basically have stenographic, um, you just basically write down what a press release said and that counts as, as news. And really being able to say, wow, there are ways that you could change this. And um, there are definitely, and, and it's just a vulnerability. And there are ways that you can also um, take advantage of it. Like if, if people write down press releases and put them in the news, then make more press releases. Um, there are, you can help people form better strategies for missions that you find important. And so that's kind of the end of our, um, what we do portion. Uh, Beach and I wanted to give a little bit of a description of our path to Novetta because I'm sure that you've never heard of Novetta before this um, talk. It's um, now a kind of medium-sized contractor in the DC area um, among many other contractors. And um, I, has, I had never heard of Novetta when I was, when I joined basically. I think I remember some of my early materials for preparing for the the interview, and I'm ashamed to admit this in front of Beach because I never. It was like I think I called it Veneta in my in my in my saved files, so I didn't know what Novetta was. And the if you do decide to pursue a pursue jobs in contracting, it's very possible that you also will not recognize the company. Um, they but they will be advertising and they will advertise for things like um, language skills that you've got and or other hard skills you have that make you a unicorn and that they need to staff immediately because the big difference between a contractor and government is that they don't expect you to stick around forever. They expect you to be here for a contract that needs to be filled right now. And so there's a lot of dynamism and there's always you always know that you're on a problem that is big and important. Um, so how I got to Nevada is I started kind of paying attention to digital humanities when I was at Pitt doing my doctoral program between 2012 and 2016. I was not like, it was not a very well-developed program at that point and I wouldn't say that digital humanities itself got me this job. I'm not a technical person. It, I don't have a technical role at Novetta. Um, but what it did do was let me think about alternative ways to approach job searching, where in 2016, as I was applying to jobs in the academic job market and also looking at jobs outside the academic job market, digital humanities gave me a good opportunity to think about non-alternative um, careers. So there were things like digital humanities centers to apply to. There were some really interesting postdocs in Europe that were very specific and needed, and needed um, digital humanities background. But I mean, I came out of that with two 
languages and a basic awareness of, of uh, XPath related languages from David Birnbaum's uh, computational methods in the humanities and a basic awareness of computational linguistics from Nade Han's um, course on that subject, with, which also taught Python, which was great. Um, and it really gave me a chance to think about outside of the very limited Slavic languages and literatures positions that were available for uh, PhDs. Um, so what, I, what did I do? I was not particularly focused. You'll see from Beach that he was much more directed about how he was looking for a job. I just kind of was tagging along with my non-academic friends and my sister was seeking a job at the time. And so I just kind of went along and, and talked with who they were talking to about what, um, what a person with my background looked like to them. And they were saying, wow, there's some really shady stuff going on with Russia. You should definitely, there's lots of problems for you to solve and you should figure out how to plug yourself into the solution. And I was like, well, that's great. I have no idea how to do that. Um, what am I supposed to do? Just walk up to a CEO and, and say, I have a, you have a problem and I have a solution, which is what they were recommending I do. And, um, but the nice thing about this was that um, one of those people that said, there's a problem and I know that there's a problem and you could be part of the solution, called me out of the blue for a, a position that needed to be filled immediately for a really big project, the biggest project that they'd ever done at Novetta in this particular section of Nevada, it's not the biggest part of Nevada, um, to measure Russian influence in Europe and um, more or less US efforts to counter it. And I kind of jumped in with both feet and made a lot of interesting mistakes that mostly boil down to, I should have trusted my expertise more and not let some things get baked in early on that then when other experts came around and said, why the heck are we doing that? It's like, I didn't want to countermand somebody. Um, but uh, all around, it's been successful. We've grown as a team. The first person that, the first person to grow this team though was Beach Gray. And so I'm gonna turn it over to him to talk about his path. I mute myself. Thank you, Elise. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't thank Elise enough because basically how I got the job is, you know, uh, I was recruit uh, Elise had a job opening. She let people in her department know I applied to the job uh, and, and I got the job. And so uh, grateful to her for that. But also uh, it's been good for her because she's got somebody who's also uh, able to, to share the work and um, so, and because of our good work in the beginning and because of, you know, being positioned well, the, the team was able to expand from just, you know, uh, her and I to, or her and me to, um, to a team of the, of the now 10 people total. So the, the point there is that, you know, I was fortunate to know Elise, but I still had to go through, uh, you know, two rounds of interviews. I still had to study up. I still had to present well, and I still had to prove myself at the job. So uh, like Elise, you know, I was finishing my PhD. I was considering my options, and I was looking a lot around a lot for, for a job and looking within academia and outside academia. And I'll just say you should be prepared for a lot of dead ends. I hit a lot of dead ends. I sent a lot of you know, uh, resumes into black holes. And my, the advice I can give you is you need some sort of connection. I know people have gotten jobs without connections, but it's, it's relatively rare. So uh, LinkedIn, uh, look at people who have gone, like me and like Elise, who have gone to your own mater uh, and just request, you know, if they're doing something in the industry that you're interested in, don't say, hey, give me a job. Say, hey, I'd like to learn more about what you do. Come with smart questions. And most people will be willing to talk to you. And then later down the road, I say, oh, I talked to this really smart person, you know, at University of Pittsburgh. And then they, you know, followed up with me. We had a talk and that person's really smart. Oh, here's this job that came up. 
And yes, it's got to be put out there, you know, for federal reasons that, you know, everybody has to be able to see that the job is posted. But this person, I know that they're smart and they might get an interview, whereas other people that, you know, um, may not necessarily get to get an interview. So um, networking is, is your best friend. And um, I, and also look broadly because I looked really broadly and, uh, you know, I was looking at a consulting job in the private sector in New York. I got to the final round, didn't get it. Uh, there was a job at Colby College, a one-year visiting lectureship. I got to the final round. It was two people. I didn't get it. Uh, I was going to go to, on the Project Go uh, program to Narva, Estonia, and lead that and I was set up to do that and this job came up. So I had to pivot and had to say, sorry, I uh, hope you guys can get somebody else. So just be prepared for dead ends and reach out to people and learn as much as you can by informational interviews. And with Elisa's boss, so I got the job in at the end of the 2017 academic year in May. Um, so, in that in May of 2017, so in November 2016, I was talking to Elise, who had a job at Novetta because she was a connection, and I knew that she was cool and she would talk to me. So we talked about the job, and she's like, "Why don't you talk to my boss?" I talked to her boss, had a good conversation, and you know, he was uh, and still is uh, very smart and got exactly what I was had done with my dissertation. And then you know, we had a good conversation and. Um, at the end of it, he's, uh, I said, well, if a job ever comes up, uh, you know, previously shot out to me. So definitely will. Well, I had said that to 10 other people. So, <laughs> you know, that was the one that worked out. So spread a broad net and don't think, you know, don't, don't be intimidated by job descriptions and not having a clearance. So, uh, I didn't have a clearance coming to the job. Elise didn't have a clearance coming to the job and you've got to start somewhere. So that's one thing. Don't be discouraged by that. Uh, the second thing is like, if you have absolutely every qualification that the job requires, you are overqualified for that job and you're not going to learn much in that job. So you want some of the qualifications, otherwise you can't even get your foot in the door. But if you have all of them, then, you know, then you should probably be looking for reaching a little bit higher. So uh, be bold, apply for things you don't think you have a chance for and, you know, uh, and, and try to, you know, I, my mistake was I just did everything, applied to 50 jobs. What I should have done is been more focused and, you know, done more networking, but you still have to, it's still a numbers game. So even though you're well-educated, you're smart, I know that you are, or else you wouldn't be in race, you wouldn't be graduating, uh, from Pitt, but, um, you know, if you're looking for a job after you graduate, now is the time. Uh, and even if you're not going to graduate until 2022, you know, see if you can get an internship this summer. See if you can start networking because, you know, this is this is what it's been building up to. And um, once you get a job, it's going to be really cool. So I think we're at the uh, point for questions, Trevor. Yeah, uh, you know, thank you both so much for the really interesting uh, presentation for for sharing your stories. Uh, you know, I, I know I've got a lot of questions, but I, I think we should open it up to the to the floor to the students. Um, uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself or raise your hand and uh, ask whatever questions you might have. Anybody? Not all at once. Ah, there we go. Alec, go ahead. Thanks, Trevor. And um, I'd like to say thank you uh, uh, both to Beach and um, Elise for you know fantastic presentations. So the question I had was, do you guys think there are any like specific softwares that would be particularly helpful to know if you're trying to get become like a data analyst, for example, um, you know, off the top of my head, one that always pops up is like R. So do you think it'd be useful to know that to some extent? Yes. Um, especially if you would like to be 
I think R is really useful for analysis. Um, Python is useful if you would like to talk to developers because that's kind of the universal language of communication for them and they're developing tools. Although there's all sorts of all sorts of uh, specificities, but in terms of doing research and designing designing better research, uh, R is R is probably a good way to go. And you'll definitely I think that in general any any programming language you can pick up gives you the ability to speak the language of of tech people and to say what they're saying, except for say it with say it intelligibly. And um, <laughs> yeah, so R is great. R is a great choice if you have to choose one. Excuse me, does R stand for something? If that's how do you spell that? Just R. If you search for R statistics package or okay, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. More questions. Thank you. Here we go. Uh, that I see is that Eric and then Dara, or just Dara. Go ahead, Dara. Uh, okay. Oh, um, and then Eric. Yeah. Sorry. Um, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I am actually not a part of Reese. I am studying Latin American studies here at Pitt, but in um, the future, I'm hoping to study security and intelligence studies in graduate school. So I was just wondering, um, at Noveta, is your focus mainly on what's going on in, in Rus Russia and Eastern Europe, or do you sort of have focus, uh, focuses on uh, many different parts of the world? Hi, Dara. I'll take this question, at least, and we can uh, just go, go back and forth. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, glad you're into Latin American studies. And so, you know, we're contractors, so we don't work to, for the government directly, but you still need to be a U.S. citizen. And, you know, our mo the vast majority of our contracts are for the U.S. government. So the contract that Elise and I work on has to do with Europe and Russia, but we have uh, a contract with the Center for Disease Control in Africa. So that's all about Africa. That's all about, you know, uh, COVID and how to, you know, fight COVID and, and you know, how to message properly uh, in all of the country, 54 countries uh, of Africa. We also have uh, a couple contracts, I guess it's just one, uh, that is global. So looking at, you know, everything. Um, uh, and we have had uh, contracts in the past that have to do with um, Latin America and specifically, you know, looking to counter drug trafficking. So uh, there's a couple different routes. One is that you find a company that has a contract that has something to do with Latin America. Uh, and the other is that you develop into more of a generalist, which it sounds like you're doing, and you are saying, okay, I have a deep knowledge of Latin America, but also uh, I know a lot uh, about security. I know a lot about, you know, political analysis, and therefore, you know, I am uh, able to talk intelligently about anything, and, you know, I know... I don't know what languages you know, I'm assuming you know Spanish and maybe some Portuguese, and I can, you know, you leverage those and, you know, look at uh, other parts of the world that speak those languages or pick up languages uh, quickly. So I'd also say, you know, keep your options broad, remind people you're an expert on Latin America, but that you're uh, able to pivot. And if you're interested in computer, computer programming, that's always uh, going to be an asset, but go in with the knowledge that you did have to do that in your job. So is that something you want to do or, or not? So th that's something to consider as you're pursuing your graduate studies. But yes, definitely the short answer is yes, there are some contracts that have specifically to do with Latin America, but also think about the ones that you could do just using your general expertise and, and uh, knowledge you've gained so far. Thank you very much. Awesome, Eric, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't actually have a question, but now that Trevor's called me out. Um, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, so both uh, Elise and uh, both uh, Elise and Beach, sorry. Uh, both of you guys ha started at Novetta after a PhD. Um, I'm still an undergrad and I'm wondering how many uh, of your colleagues just came to Novetta straight out of undergrad without any graduate school. Um, we weren't the first job for anybody apart from Beach and Elise um, on our team. I think that there are a number of people who had Arabic when that was an important thing to have, who kind of jumped into this as their first job. PhD is definitely not required. In fact, I think that they don't like having to pay the premium for a PhD. By the way, you should ask for the premium salary. <laughs> uh, other mistake that I made. Um, but one thing to do as an undergrad, there are a ton more opportunities to do internships as an undergrad. And um, or as a recent undergrad than there are as a person who's been out of the been out of been out of college for a few years. There are very far fewer of those. So um, that is not a great answer. There are, there's I think one person with just a BA, a number of people with a master's in our team, but a lot of people who don't have masters um, in the division as a whole. Who just had the language and then picked up a lot of other stuff to go to go along and uh i'm not sure that language is quite so important as it used to be area some area some kind of expertise is very helpful um but we've that, that used to be a much bigger barrier to the work that we do than now because now we are doing a lot of machine translation um which gives us access to things like to lesser, less commonly taught languages like Tagalog or um, mostly Tagalog. This, this is the thing that I have in mind. Um, but if you know your stuff about something specific, then that's probably going to be, if they're hiring somebody new for a contract, that's where they're going to hire. So um, the Africa CDC uh, contract that Beach mentioned, there are a couple of legacy people who did, were not hired on the basis of their Africa expertise. And once that project was healthy enough, one more person was hired who was only Africa, who, who came from an Africa background. So, um, and I don't know, so sorry, I'm going far afield from, can you do this without a PhD? Yes. Um, and you're getting a good start early by going to these networking events and asking these questions and hopefully going in and nosing around LinkedIn because we get, we get bonuses for recruiting people, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> as soon as you tell people that you're interested, it's like, oh, this person should definitely be, um, you should definitely pay attention to this person because I'm gonna get $2,000 if you hire him, no matter what. Um, Beach, I don't, I don't want to cut you off because this is a kind of general question. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll jump in. I would definitely agree with Elise. Like that was just kind of our, the path that Elise and I took. Both of us, um, you know, are intellectual people and wanted to do the PhD for its own sake. And then, you know, you grow within the PhD and, you know, being a professor is very different from being a grad student. So that's just to say, you know, you don't have to become a professor because you went to, to graduate school. So I would say, yeah, two pieces of advice. Don't let that be a barrier and jump in if you're like, I'm ready to, you know, I, I've kind of quenched my academic thirst for the time being, I want a job. Jump in and then once you have the job, you can get the company you work for to pay for your masters. And then once you get your masters through doing night courses, they are uh, obligated to give you a pay raise. 
that's awesome. Um, or, you know, don't do a master's, do whatever you want. Uh, I'd also agree with Elise, and this is a really important thing to network is wait and say, hey, I'm going to apply to this job and then they can refer you and then you'll get a special link or something like that. But if you just talk to somebody and then just put your application in the system, they can get the referral. So think about that and think about also the dynamic that Elise is, is talking about. Hey, if somebody contacts me and I, can, and I can get them a job and I can get a bonus and I can get a smart person to work on my team, All right, that's really helpful. Okay, mo any more questions? Did I miss anyone? Okay, well, I'll, I'll just ask one one um, one question. What what do you see as like the kind of the future of of your field? I mean, where where, where are the trends? Where, where are things going? And um, you know, how how best to prepare for for the way it's going to look. You know, down there is going to be an intense interest in leveraging big data to do things like predict and I think, so big artificial intelligence is outside of the expertise that you're, not, you're probably getting at Reese or in USIS, and that's okay. But knowing what the trends are in AI and the big questions that are being asked so just kind of following news sites along those uh, news sites that discuss those things and that talk about the challenges of cybersecurity and, and how cybersecurity interacts with the information environment. Those are two different things, cybersecurity and AI. I, I'm muddling things, but I think watching the current problems because those are only going to become bigger. The surface area just expands exponentially as far as cybersecurity goes and we do not seem to and we don't seem to have a very good grasp of of how to regulate it yeah um so that's kind of inarticulate but but um if you have I, i'm gonna toss this over to beach so that he can take advantage of having thought for a few seconds yeah, I would agree with Elise in terms of, you know, both the industry and kind of what we monitor, artificial intelligence is going to change things because you're going to have both better methods for doing what we do and also, you know, uh, <laughs> articles that are, uh, you know, written by uh, bots that are, in, that you know, it, it, it's impossible to to tell whether it was written by a human or a bot. There's you know, going to be a manipulation of images. It's impossible to tell the difference between something that was recorded live and something that's been manipulated. So that's going to be difficult. Disinformation, media manipulation are here to stay. Um, and yeah, I agree with Elise. Like you don't have to become uh, a software engineer, um, but if you're interested, you know, technology is what what moves the, the company forward, but also like having people with this sort of deep experiences that you develop through uh, Reese and the deep uh, regional expertise, that's still going to be uh, relevant, especially understanding geopolitics, understanding mentality and motivation. Uh, that's, that's still going to be um, relevant and, and having people to interpret what's going on and being able to think and adapt, you know, what you learn uh, in, in your undergraduate and other studies is, is the ability to learn quickly and to adapt uh, and to write well. So yeah, artificial intelligence, machine learning is going to change things, but also, you know, the, the skills that you've developed 
are, are still relevant and valuable and and rare to a certain extent there's you know 800 900 people in this thousand person company that at least and i work for that are really good at coding and if i took undergraduate courses and and strive for years i would get up to a novice level and they'd still well at least is, is actually pretty good at coding but uh you know the thing that makes me valuable and rare is deep knowledge of russia uh deep knowledge of russian um, mentality and motivations uh, and, and writing skills um, and some other skills that I've developed on the job. So the point is don't sell yourself short. You'll be able to adapt, but, but know that the learning process is, is going to be uh, ongoing and the job that you get um, out of school is going to be vastly different than the one you have in 30 or 40 years. Well, thank you both so much. I, I think we'll wrap it up now. Um, uh, everyone give a, give a round of applause as best you can on, on Zoom uh, and, and thank our very generous guests. And uh, yeah, we'll, um, we'll be talking to you later. So thanks. Uh, yeah, definitely consider us a resource. Um, kind of left the PowerPoint before our emails came out, but ho hopefully Trevor can share those if, if need be. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll share the recording with anyone who, who missed out today. And uh, yeah, this has been really helpful, really interesting. Good luck, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for having us, Trevor. This was super positive.